So just to remind everyone where we are, this is our homepage, uh, rockefelleruniversity.github.io. We have our videos. I haven't put last Monday's video on yet. I will do that today and I will add today's video at the same time. Um, we have worked through a lot of our training, including introduction to R, plotting in R, so the basics. We looked a little bit at reproducible, how we can make R markdown. I don't know if anyone has been watching the R Studio conference recently. They had some really great announcements about reproducible R, some exciting things going. In fact, I'm not sure if anyone actually saw the conference, but it's kind of interesting to see that this we are using is called R Studio. They've actually changed the name to Posit because they want to cater for Python. So R Studio is now going to be called Posit rather than uh, R Studio. I think that's great news. It means more support for Python. Hopefully, a, a nice uh, unified GUI we can use for both. We then looked at like, things like genomics data. So the types of data we will see, how we can visualize that in IGB, and how we can handle that type of data using Bioconductor, which is the base for all high throughput sequencing analysis, really. Um, there are packages in CRAN which aren't in Bioconductor and are still useful, but most of them uh, have found a home in Bioconductor, including any package we write. And then we got started in RNA-seq and we had in our first two sessions, very practical, we took some data, we built an indexed genome, we aligned our RNA-seq to that genome, and then we counted in gene models using all bioconductor um, tool sets, but also bioconductor annotation. Remember, if you have your own FASTA, your own GTF, all of this we can do without using the bioconductor uh, annotation. We then quickly went through how we can import this into a summarized experiment object and then into a DSeq2 object. And it was there that we could already do some pairwise comparisons, which is the majority of the analysis we need to do for RNAs. So in this session, it's um, actually kind of combined some other sessions together. Usually what I would do is split out the visualization uh, into its own session, but through feedback from uh, people in this class, they want to kind of do this in the middle of RNA-seq. So that's exactly what we're going to do today. And I do think it actually fits very well there. So we've covered alignment and counting, going from raw data to read counts. We then looked at how we can do differential gene expression analysis paired. So, so one sample versus another. And today we'll look at how we can use two uh, really important techniques, principal component analysis and clustering to really get a visualization of your data. Um, and I've always said that IGV is very important to review your data. Um, and this helps you look at individual loci, really locations, genes in your genome. PCA and clustering is going to allow us to look across all our genes, all our genome and get an idea of what's happening get an idea of the major sources of variation, the major changes between samples, and also how well our samples group, um, if they are within the same sample group or between sample groups. So we're gonna take some ENCODE data for this, um, and we need three groups because we're gonna start doing some visualization. Um, so I take all this from Bing Ren's lab, and this is all ENCODE data. You should be able to follow the link. Uh, and it will take us to the actual place where we can get this, where I got this data from. You see, it's kind of old, 2011. <clears throat> it's over 10 years old. But poly-A RNA-seq, which is what we described in our first session for this. So RNA-seq, which has been poly-A captured, we're sure it's mRNA. It could be long, non-coded RNA as well. That's poly-A tailed. But cleaned up data, and then they've produced it. And I have already processed this through alignment. So I have followed exactly what we've done in class. Um, I've aligned it the same way. I counted it the same way. And this produced a range summarized experiment object, which had our counts in genes. And then I've saved that as an R data. So you can load this now. 
Um, and often this is what you'll do. You'll get your data, you'll save it as an intermediate file. And I've saved it in a data directory, GC tissue full day, full dot R data. So we can actually just load that quickly. I just loaded it before class, but if you wanted to follow along, you do session, set your working directory to wherever you've downloaded the material for this class. So I've downloaded it to downloads, go into your R course and there we then have the data directory right above us. And I can just do load data. So uh, previously, we've been really looking at <clears throat> just comparing between two sample groups. So I think we had activated and uh, quiescent or quiet, so resting, I guess you would say, T cells. Quite often, we need to start looking across multiple groups, both for RNA-seq and attack-seq and chip-seq um, and biological data. We can definitely consider high-dimensional. We have thousands of uh, uh, genes, often hundreds of samples. We may have thousands of peaks across the genome, hundreds of samples. So it's high dimensional and it can be kind of hard to pick out these patterns, um, what is really happening in your data. But we can use some really common techniques to visualize our genomics data, which include things like dimension reduction or clustering. So we can perhaps simplify our data to the major patterns of expression, and that would be dimension reduction. Or we can cluster our data, we can find genes which have similar patterns of expression across samples. They are up in one sample group, down in all the other. We can cluster those genes together and make our life of interpretation that much easier. Yeah. So I just got some examples here, and these are from some papers we've worked on, really simple versions of it, but this is with the Fuchs lab, um, we worked on this last year, I think it was cell stem cell, um, where we can see control samples all right next to each other here. So this is day 30, day six control. And we can see here, those which have been with a particular treatment are certainly separated from everything else. And those which experienced this treatment and then went back, uh, sorry, and then further to day 30. So this is a time progression here have kind of returned along this axis to roughly the same level, but a little different across this axis. Okay. So just by looking at this, we can already get an understanding that the controls are all very similar. This is very different. And along this axis, this post inflammation has kind of returned, at least across this axis, to the same level. Okay. So we can use these visualization techniques both to allow us to understand the data, but actually we can use it to group our data and do further analysis. So we're going to compare three tissues, um, which is a lot more complex than we had before, as I just said, but using these approaches, we should be able to make our life uh, reasonably easy in interpreting the results. So it's already been mapped counted with our subread, and then I've used the summarize overlaps function uh, to create our range summarized experiment data. So it looks like this, um, and we can then process that further with DC. Let's just have a reminder of our range summarized experiment object. So what was it called? We can look in here to see what's in my environment. I have gene counts, so I can quickly have a look at this. To the class is a range summarized experiment. I have, I guess this is mouse. I have uh, 14,000 genes for this particular range summarized experiment object. Six samples, and we can see the column names here heart, heart two, liver, liver two, and there's some in the middle. I have already attached column data, so metadata to this, and that is. Um, by tissue, and we can see we actually have row names as well, and these will be entrees gene IDs. Remind us, if we want to look at the cold data, we should be able to just do this. Have a look at the metadata associated to these samples. 
and you can see we have two of every sample group. We have heart one, heart two in the, in the tissue heart group, kidney, kidney, kidney group, liver one, liver two, liver three. So still quite a simple experiment, um, but now at least we have three conditions and we can remember if we wanna to get to the actual matrix within this object. So here the counts, we can also use this assay function and that will give us a matrix. And here, just looking at the first three rows, we have our pre-normalized counts. And we have our entrees gene IDs here. So range summaries of experiment objects are super useful. Uh, we saw that if you wanna to start to do some differential on them, we can use these two functions, dseq dataset, and it will take our ranged summarized experiment object has all the information it already needs. We just need to tell it what we want to test over, what, what groups we're particularly interested in. And here I'm going to say tissue. I'm just basing that on the fact it's our only column here. And then we run the DSeq workflow, which will go off and do, let's watch it do it now. We'll go, go off and do the uh, normalization. Oh, sorry, I need to load the DSeq library. Okay, so that will go off and it runs our estimation and normalization, which is estimating size factors. It calculates our gene specific variation. So each gene is variable across samples. It then uses the mean, dis the mean dispersion relationship. So higher mean values, less variance, lower mean expression, more variance. And then it will calculate the final fitted dispersions. And then it fits the whole overall model for our data. Once we have that, we can start to do oops, some very simple tests. And we can do our analysis or comparison of sample groups. So here we just use the results function. We pass our differential DC2 object. And then we list the contrast we want to compare. And it's usually, if it's all, it's not always, but it most usually is a factor of three, sorry, a vector of length three, where we will have the group we want to test is the first, uh, first value. The second is the value we want to have as our test. And the second value is our control. So it's liver minus kidney here. And, um, over the tissue group. So we can actually just run this. If you ever want to see, actually, we can also use this function. I haven't shown you this results names. We just pass that function our object. It tells us the comparisons, it's automatically made by default. But we can specify any comparison we want using this results tissue liver minus kidney. And then that gives us the special object, which is like a DC2 object. And it tells us uh, the actual comparison it made. And it tells us a little bit about here this special version of a data frame comparing or having the base mean, which is the mean expression across all samples. The log fold change liver minus kidney, uh, log fold change standard error. So how much we trust this log fold change. Stat is log fold change divided by this. And then p-value is the use of the stat with the appropriate distribution. Okay, but this isn't quite a data frame as we understand it. This is a capital D, capital F data frame. It's a bioconductor data frame. Um, on trace gene ID here. We can, of course, just convert these objects into our standard data frames, uh, which is what I usually do. And we can do this just by doing as dot data frame, and we can convert a lot of objects using something like this. We have as dot vector, as dot character. In this case, it makes sense. We can convert a bioconductor data frame 
to a standard data frame just by doing as dot data frame. We'll get an object for look, which looks very similar. Um, oh, sorry. I haven't done that comparison yet. So let's do liver. Just a little bit more um, like we're used to seeing, right? And then from that, we can do all the standard accesses like access columns or subset rows. One thing we always do when we get these objects is unless we are filling in the p-values like we showed you last time, typically we have NA for p-adjusted values where the gene was very low expressed. This is how DC2 um, filters um, for its multiple uh, discovery rate correction. So if we just look at this, we can see how many genes actually had a p-adjusted of zero, of NA, sorry. Let's go with this. Um, Really want to do table on that. Seems a little bit like I might have already filtered this. So I think I've already filtered this before we came to our work. But if not, you could do this is NA. So this would just filter out any columns where the P adjusted was not an A. It's going to keep. And that's how we can get out the NA P adjusted values. And then finally, say for this one. I'm just going to subset down to log fold change and p adjusted. We already have the row names which contain the on phrase IDs. And now I have two data frames here which contain just log fold change, p adjusted value, and the row names of the actual IDs. Okay. We might want to quickly just add some additional column names to this because if we look here, the column names are always just log fold change based mean. So if we want to group merge these two files together, we're going to need to give them new column names. So here I'm just going to add the name of the comparison to the column name. So I'll do heart versus kidney, and I'm going to add a little separator here. And then I will attach that to the present column names. And update. Let's have a little look, actually. I just want to try and explain that a bit more in R. So if we have uh liver versus kidneys data frame we just want to update this and easily by replacing the column names with the column names plus this additional uh, liver minus kidney, liver versus kidney. It's gonna work. You can see now we would have liver versus kidney in front of every column. So when we group two tables together, we know where the original column came from. So once we've done that, we can just merge these two data frames together and we'll, we'll merge it by the row names the row names are the entrees ID, the gene IDs. And once we've done that, we can start to have a useful table to compare across multiple results, right? We have one table where we have entrees ID here. We have the log fold change in heart versus liver. We have the significance of it in heart versus liver. And in the same table, we have heart versus kidney and heart versus kidney here. We can now then, with this one table, start to filter down to our genes of interest. And if we want those which are upregulated in heart in both conditions, it's not complex. We just need to set up a very, well, I guess, a reasonably complex set of filters. So we will take those which had a log fold change in this column greater than zero, and those which had a log fold change in this column greater than zero and had a p adjusted less than 0 0.05 and had a p adjusted less than 0 0.5 in this comparison. 
Okay, so it has to fill all these conditions. And this will give me a big true false vector. And I can use that true false vector to filter the table we came from down to just those which pass this condition. So up significantly in both comparisons. You now look at that table. We have those which are up by fold change, the significance here, and we have these rows. So although these are entrees IDs aren't so super useful to us here, we know how to add uh, gene symbols to them. So we could actually just already have a sensible table of genes which might be useful, very upregulated. Um, I guess would be considered heart specific, right? Because they're up in the heart versus liver and kidney by at least uh, a certain degree. We can also actually create um, something like a Venn diagram. I know these are very useful to look at Venn diagrams. People like to know what's in common. So we can do that from our data frame very straightforward way. We just need to create another data frame which has two columns saying false or true to see if they were upregulated. So in this case, I'm gonna make a data frame and I will have one column called up versus liver, one called up versus kidney. And I will fill that column with a true false vector, just saying, was it up in this column? Was it uh, less than a p-value p-adjusted of 0.05 in that column? And that will define my up versus liver vector. And I could do the same thing for the up versus kidney. And then I will have this kind of true false data frame. And that I can just pass to the Lima, uh, Lima package. I think we mentioned Lima as an alternative for RNA seq analysis. It has one really nice function called a Venn diagram. And we can pass it this false false, 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 true table. And it will just find all the cases which are um, true in both will go in the middle, false or true, true or false. And it will create this very easy Venn diagram for you. So creating stuff um, and finding what's common in the middle of a Venn diagram, you know, that's a nice way. And it's a simple way of saying this is up in both. But there will often be cases where it's a little bit more subtle and it might be up a lot in one, um, but not quite past your filters in the other. So it may appear to be here, but actually it just didn't quite pass your test and maybe it really belongs in here. So visualization and clustering may be a nicer approach to um, find genes which are common or distinct. So we have lots of techniques which are available to us here to to do this. Um, before we do any visualization of our data, a really common thing to do is to transform our count data to the log two scale. Okay, so we kept our data as counts for doing our differential, but for visualization, we do want a log two transformer. Okay, this just means that changes at very high uh, expressed genes will be look equivalent to the changes which we'll see at very low expression. It just helps this visualization. There is a slight problem is that we can't log to transform zero. So we need to add a pseudo count. And what most tools do is they just add one to every single value in your table so that all the zeros become ones and everything else just gains one count. So we can actually do that in one step again by using a norm transform and norm transform will take our dseq object and it will do the plus one to our counts it will log transform them and it will return to us a new dseq object called a dseq transform object it actually is basically the same range summarized expression object um, and we can access information from this in the same way. If I want to get the normalized counts from this object, they're still stored in the assays slot. So I could do assay on my recently transformed norm log two counts, and I can get back my matrix of normalized values. So actually, I kind of want to show you that quickly. So I have a DDS object here. 
secondary norm, norm transform. Uh, in a second, now I have my dseq transform object, but it has all the same slots as my dseq object. I still have cold data, although now I can see my normalization factors here. And I can still access the normalized values now. Look, I now have my normalized values. No longer counts, right? Because they're not whole numbers, but these are now log transforms. So if I want to not use any of my upcoming R visualization techniques, I can still do the normalization and transformation in R. I can just extract the counts or the normalized values here and then write that to file, right? So simple as i.csv, that's the thing, file equals i. And I think a lot of people like to export this to other tools, maybe GUIs. We never want row names. Or maybe we do actually have because we got. Okay. So that's how you could do that. Oh, sorry, I'm using write CSV, so I don't need to tell it what the separator is. In this case, what we want to do is just check here the normalization. Um, and we can quickly do a box plot from our base R. And we'll take our matrix of normalized values. And I'm going to give it, tell it. Last equals two is just telling it to uh, orientate these um, labels this way. Give it the names I want to plot. Now I have my box plot. And we can see that actually the distribution of scores or counts, normalized counts here, looks pretty good. Maybe this one sticks a little bit out, looks a little different. When visualizing our data, um, we can see actually we have a similar problem to we were worrying about with this DC transform. Um, sorry, when we were looking at this mean variance relationship. Okay. Genes which are lower expressed tend to have more variance than those which are higher expressed. Okay, and this can cause biases to where you actually detect differences in differential expression. So we can use this library VSN, and actually VSN is the precursor to lots of the DSeq normalizations, it's variance stabilizing normalization. And we can use this function just to give us our mean SD plot. And I think we've seen something very similar to this before, where we had like a scatter plot of uh, counts versus their variation or dispersion here versus our mean uh, rank. And what we can see here is actually it's very different. Our dispersion standard deviation here is very different from our standard deviation. There is a function which is very much recommended inside DC2 called rlog. So this is regularized log. And it's going to attempt to do to our data what DC has kind of accounted for in its tests. It is going to try and model this relationship between standard deviation and expression level and try and reduce shrink the variance for genes based on their mean expression so lower expressed will have slight shrinkage in their variance to run this is very straightforward we just use r log which previously you we used norm transform here we use r log um, and this takes a little bit of time so if i run this now it's not instantaneous like the other one uh, but, 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 but. Take a few seconds and actually for bigger samples, it can really take a while. So, uh, certainly not instantaneous. Oh, but it was complete just now. But again, we'll get this R, uh, this uh, norm transform object, this DC transform object. And we can do all the same things as we did for the uh, object we just pre-created previously. Now though, it's a little harder to tell if we look at our mean SD plot um, from R log versus the norm transform. I really need to put these on the same scale, but actually the difference between standard deviation here and here is much smaller now for our R log norm types. Right? 
So this goes from around one to 0 0.4, where this is going from around 1.5 to 0 0.5. So I need to put these on the same scale to make this a little bit more sensible. But effectively, our log has done a better, a better um, job of modeling this mean and variance relationship. So we're, we're advised to use our log if we want to do visualization of our data. How much time have I got? So I'm going to talk about some of these techniques now um, that we can use to hopefully simplify um, what we're asking of our data. So often we're trying to measure thousands of genes across multiple samples. Um, and this actually presents a problem, right? We have really high dimensionality. We don't want to look at genes individually. We want to try and find patterns, groups of genes which act in a similar way across samples. Um, and these are often defined or called things like eigen or metagenes. So genes which aren't, aren't real, there is no gene which does this, but it's an average expression of uh, a set of genes. So we can represent a thousand genes by one pattern. We hope the strongest sources of variation in our data, so the strongest changes in our data, the biggest variation, is associated with changes between sample groups. So if we look at this example here, let me move this a bit. This is the heart group, and then this is the kidney and liver. This change here, from this heart to these groups here, we could say is very much associated to heart, right? So we want... Um, the biggest changes in our data, data, the major patterns to kind of separate out our groups. Okay, so we can use this also as a measure of quality. If the major sources of variation separate our groups, that probably means our experiment has worked well. Okay, so some common um, methods for dimension reduction include PCA, which is a really fantastic method and you'll see a lot. Multifactorial scaling, uh, which is also very common and also non-negative matrix factorization. So actually, uh, NMF, we've used a bit with the Hatton Lab, um, and they have some papers which are used us a lot. But NMF has come back as a, a good uh, dimension reduction technique for single cell analysis, so it's having a resurgence there. So we can actually do a PCA very simply um, by just using the dseq2's plot PCA function. Okay, and this is going to take a dseq transform object, such as our norm transform object or our R log transformation. It's going to run the PCA and it's going to visualize it as a ggplot for us. Okay. We just need to provide additional to our, um, our norm transformed object, our DC transformed object. We need to tell it what groups we want to use to color by in this plot. So in group here will be tissue. And we need to tell it how many genes we actually want to use in this um, calculation of this PCA plot. Okay, so this is an interesting um, kind of choice. How, how do you choose how many genes? By default, plot PCA, if you don't specify n top, it's going to use the top 500. And that kind of comes back to Wolfgang Huber um, who'd written a paper showing that the top 500 often capture the major sources of variation in our data. I often quite like to use all of our data. So here I'm gonna use as many rows as we have in our R log tissue, which is the number of genes. And if we can look at the plot now, what it does is group our samples along these major sources of variation. So say the two biggest sources of variation in our data the two biggest patterns, like this one here, and how our samples separate along these patterns. So we can see we have two major sources of variance, the first accounting for 51% of our overall variance, the second 94% of our overall variance. So that's 95%, right, overall. So that's most of our changes in our data. We can really summarize in two dimensions. Um, and if we look, I just said this, um, but if we look, we can also get start to get an understanding kind of of how our 
data separates. Along the major source of variation, what appears to be most different is our heart and our liver samples, right? Because they're further separated across this principal component. Interestingly, interestingly, if we look across our second principal component, we can see that heart and liver don't separate. Is that heart and liver? Yeah, okay. Not sure why we say kidney there. Um, but kidney, you can see, is all the way down here, right? So there is another source of variation in our data which just separates the kidney from all the other samples. Okay, so in one plot, we can kind of get an idea about the biggest changes in our data. So PCA, that type of plot is often used just as quality control. And that's kind of useful. It's nice and it tells you the difference between my groups is bigger than the difference within my groups. And it tells you where the major changes are. We can actually extract a little bit more information from this and we can actually tell you which genes are actually driving this separation. And that can be really useful too. And it's not always so clear cut like if you have lots of sample groups and maybe human data, it's a little bit messy. You might actually want to use the PCs as part of your explorative uh, analysis. Okay. So under the hood, and if you go look at the code, which actually is taking place in DC2, it's using this function PRComp to construct the PCA. So we can do this ourselves just by um, boop, 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 extracting the our log matrix we did here. So I've already extracted the actual matrix using assay from here to give us our matrix. And I can pass that to the PR comp function. So this principal component function, I just need to first transpose it because it wants it to be the other orientation. So if I do that, I get back a PR comp object. And I can already see I have one slot available to me. And if, if I do dollar $x, just like with a list, I can get access to this slot. And you can see here, it has the coordinates which were effectively used to plot this. Okay. So here we have principal component one, the position of the heart along those coordinates, along PC2, and then further PCs as well. So I can then recreate that plot we just saw um, now using base R. So I can just plot that X, um, the, the, this data frame we just saw here or this matrix by default, it just plots the first two. I can put some colors there from using the cold data from our R log object. And then I just set some sizes. So I'm gonna have character expansion too. I'll use the point um, character, which is like a proper dot, and then I'll add some legends. Okay. But this is the same plot. It's just now we can extract the result ourselves using PR comp. What's really useful about that, though, is that we can now actually look at how the genes influence um, these separation of samples along the principle. So if we look inside the rotation slot here, it's often called loadings, if anyone wants to uh, know a bit more. Um, we can look there, and again, we have a matrix, except rather than being PCs by samples, we have PCs by genes. And these values here correspond to the contribution, either positively or negatively, to the um, PCs which we're looking at. So here, a highly negative score would be making you more heart-like, pushing you this way, and a highly positive score would be making you more liver-like. Not sure how much we're gonna see on this, but we're gonna show that in the exercises, we're gonna show you how you can actually visualize the top of cross the PCA, um, cross the PCs plot. <coughs> if we want to then, we could actually start to investigate this a bit here. And what I'm gonna do is sort um, my second, or the contribution of genes to the second principal component. So I really wanna know what genes are separating heart and liver from kidney. 
I can sort by the second principal component there, and I'll do decreasing equals false. So I'm going to see um, those which are most kind of pushing us down to uh, kidney. And I'll just take the top 100 for now. Okay, so I'm not going to set any definitive cutoffs. So I'll just take the top 100. If I look at the top 10, I can see these are all very negative. Um, and these are the actual genes which are really driving this. So the genes which are really driving this kidney to be separated out here, these will be the kidney specific genes. And then if I want to start to you know, investigate what that actually looks like in terms of our differentials, so we can start to give some context, what I will do is extract the stat column from our differential expression analysis we've previously done. And I just want to get the stats for those genes which are really pushing kidney away from everything else, pushing down the principal component too. And I will just subset those stat values to that. Now, if I make a box plot of this, so if I make a box plot of our differential stats, our actual effectively fold changes, I can see already that the PCs really captured some of those genes which were detected to be most differentially expressed. So heart minus kidney, if they were negative, that means they were much higher in kidney. Liver minus kidney, that means they were much higher in uh, kidney. Heart minus liver, if they were negative, they would have been higher in uh, liver. And we can see for this comparison, the genes which were <coughs> highly contributing to PC2 barely change between heart and liver, but are very down in heart compared to liver here, and are very down in kidney versus, sorry, in liver versus kidney. So all that to really say is that, you know, even though we've done differential, we can actually use the PCs to select the top 100 genes most contributing to that second PC, and then we can show from our statistics and our differentials that they are highly differentially downregulated or upregulated in kidney. We'll talk about this more and people can ask questions, but the really nice thing about this type of analysis is that often you won't have great stats. You may have like differentials which don't give you your p-values you want. PCA can still allow you to explore. And if you see that, say, all your kidney samples are down here, maybe just too variable for stats, we can actually just use the PCs to start to see what's most, what genes most define kidney or separate heart. Okay, a really standard thing we like to do for differential expression analysis as well is our um, <clears throat> correlation between samples. So in R, we can do correlations between all samples very easily, just using this core function. And if we give our matrix um, to the core function, what it does is compare or give the correlation between every column to every other column. Okay. So that means we get back a matrix telling us the correlation of sorted heart one. This is Pearson correlation here. To sorted heart one, obviously they're perfectly correlated. Uh, sorted heart one to sorted heart two is very well correlated. Less correlated with kidney, less correlated with kidney, less correlated with liver, less correlated with liver. So that's great. And we can actually look at this matrix and already we'd be pretty happy. Heart is most correlated amongst the group, within the group. Kidney looks very correlated within the group. And um, same for liver. Often we want to visualize this, okay? And we can visualize this using a simple heat map. And we can do some clustering, just grouping the samples which are most correlated. Okay. Usually though, we give these um, uh, heat maps a distance matrix. And whereas correla correlation is a similarity, to convert it to distance is just one minus it. Right? And then that will go from similarity to distance. We then turn that into what is called a distance object using as.dist. And this is just the input for our heat map coming up. And we can turn that distance matrix into a uh, mate, sorry, a distance object 
into a matrix for plotting just by doing as dot matrix. So let me just uh, quickly show you that in R. I just want to say I'm going to be a little late for my next meeting. Okay, so let's have a little look at that R log matrix. I have an R log matrix here. Look, R log. I'll take a second. Okay, file and move. Ah, quite cool that that that's our, our DC transform object. Ah, sorry, I need to extract the actual assay. Okay, now I have the assay object, and on that I can get the correlation across samples. Oh, sorry, like that. And I can turn that into one minus just to give me the distance. And then I can turn that into an actual as distance object. And you can see it's like a slightly different form where it doesn't have the, di it has this diagonal. Right? Whereas across this diagonal, it's actually the same values. When we turn it into an as distance object, it's just a special object. So it just shows it better. You can then turn that into a matrix. Let's go matrix again. And that's actually what we use back for plotting. So then we can use this um, particular package called pheatmap, and it has a function called pheatmap, which really is a nice tool to do this kind of visualization using heat maps. There are a lot of libraries which do this, including um, heatmap3, which is great, and probably the most popular one, or one of the popular ones, is complex heatmap. Um, for my part, I find heat map is a nice, P heat map is a nice combination of fast, not slow, like complex heat map can be, but also simple to use. Okay. So to make a very straightforward heat map, we just need to load the library, library P heat map. Um, and we can just say to this, we're going to provide our sample distance matrix. And I'm going to give it for the clustering distance for the rows, so how it's going to group it. I'm going to give it that distance object I just created. And for the columns, I will also give it the same distance object. Okay, so it's already going to cluster the columns and the rows the same. And if we look, it does a reasonably sensible job. And we can see that here, it's kind of grouping uh, kidney and liver together a little bit but most samples are just clustering within their groups. I think this color scheme is a bit wrong. I don't like the red to blue. It's not usually what you see. So we can actually add our own color scale to this. Uh, more typically, people do this kind of range of blues. So here we'll do uh, the R Color Brewer Library. I think we talked a little bit about this in our plotting. I'm going to create a uh, palette of nine colors from the blues, if you remember our ggplot, we had lots of different libraries or, or scales we could get from our color brewer. One was blues. And then I'm gonna use this wonderful uh, function, which is called color ramp palette. And it will take our color scale and it's gonna create 255 kind of unique values from within our color scale. So it's gonna allow me to have a range, a much wider range of values for my heat. I'm going to reverse this because I want to be the least or the lower the distance, the uh, higher the value, the more blue it is. Now I can just provide that. I don't have to change anything else. I can just provide that color scale now to the color arguments. And this is probably what you would more often see as a sample kind of correlation or distance. Uh, dark blue meaning more similar less distance between the samples, light blue being uh, more distant, more dissimilar. We can also add some additional metadata to this, and this can be very useful. So in this case, we might want to add tissue across the top of the heat map. 
we can do that just by pro pro providing a data frame of annotation. And thankfully, for our P heat map, the format we get back from cold data is pretty much exactly the format we need for P heat. We just need to turn that into a standard data frame, and then we can provide that here to the annotation col argument, and we will get a heat map containing now metadata columns here for visualization, which show both the tissue, but also the size factors, the actual normalization. You can see that this had a very different, kidney had a very different kind of normalization factors. Maybe it had less overall RNA or something. How many more slides have I got? Because we're already getting close. Um, okay. It's going to be slightly over for this session. But... So we can use these methods of kind of clustering samples to actually cluster genes. And that's going to allow us not just to cluster samples and say these two are, these two within the same group look very similar, but we could say these genes have a similar pattern of expression across our samples. So minimizing the number of genes we actually use for clustering, because clustering samples is very computationally efficient. Clustering genes can actually be quite time expensive. So one thing we can do up front is try and find, say, genes which we know change at all across conditions. Okay, and that can be as simple as doing an ANOVA-like test. Is the variance within groups for a gene, um, is there, sorry, is the variance between groups much higher than the variance within groups, right? And that would mean a gene would be changing a lot between groups, but quite tightly expressed within a group. So we can do an ANOVA-like test in DSeq2 by just comparing the model where we actually account for tissue, we know the group information, to a model where we assume that there is no group information. And that's really easily done inside um, DSeq2. All we need to do is take our object we've already run, and we change the name of our test, and we've never had to specify this before, but now we'll change this to a log ratio test. And we will tell it that we want to compare our model to a model which is a reduced model where we have no group information. And now when we run results on this, we're going to get a data frame which actually compares, as it says here, tissue versus no model. And the p-values here and the ranking of the stat will tell you how much this gene is basically changed across groups versus its variance within groups. So we don't know where this gene is changing. We don't know uh, which groups it's different within, but we know it has a very high within group change, uh, sorry, between group change versus within group change. Worth noting, and DSync will tell this in all their manuals, but although the p-value is calculated from this, the fold change is now not very useful. The whole fold change is liver versus heart. So you have to ignore the fold change telling you what it is, but a lot of people still want to interpret this fold change. And the fact is it's got nothing to do with the p-value. If you want to, we can start to use like very simple functions to, to look at the pattern of expression for our genes. So this is our second highest gene, right? Got a very high stat, low p-value. I can use this plot counts function give it the object I just created, tell it the gene I want to plot. Again, I give it this int group, tell it how I want to group across this x-axis, sorry, yeah, x-axis. So here, tissue. And this, uh, you know, no, I know nothing about how this gene's changed yet. I can see here that, yes, it's very highly expressed in heart, but not at all in kidney or liver. To do that genome-wide, though, I'm going to need to do some clustering. Um, and we can do the clustering here on our R-log transformed gene expression matrix, but we're going to filter it down to just those genes which were significantly changing between groups somewhere. Okay, so we'll do that here by setting the p-adjusted value to be less than 0 0.1, 0 0.01, a bit of blue, no NA, 
I don't set any fold change filter. I get a list of genes here for those which significantly changed by my LRT test. I can then filter my log R log matrix down to just those genes. And that gives me now about half, 45% of the total genes. So of all the genes, this is a lot of changes in this experiment, about 45% change across conditions. I can then pass that to the pHeatMap function. All I'm gonna specify now is that I wanna scale a gene across the row and this will allow me to see whether a gene has gone up or down, median centered across rows. And I'm also going to say show row name is equals false, because there are thousands of genes in this heat map. I'm not going to be able to read the gene names. But just from looking at this, hopefully you can already see you know, the difference in patterns of expression. We have genes which are low in the heart, up in the uh, kidney, and then low in the liver again. We have genes down here which are lower in everything apart from our heart and up in the liver. But then we start to have the complexities, which are really hard to kind of extract from just comparisons. So those which were up a little in the kidney, but more so in the liver. Those here, which were up a little bit in the heart, but more so in the kidney, or in fact, the right vice versa here. So, so this clustering very simply like this allows us to see really the complexity um, of our gene expression patterns in our data. Just looking at it, it does look like heart and liver have the biggest changes and perhaps kidney is somewhere in the middle, which would fit what we saw for that principal component. Right? We see one heart on one side, liver on the other, and kidney kind of bang in the middle. So that's what it looks like at a better, better resolution than there. <clears throat> so now we've visualized it, we might want to actually kind of break it up into groups, right? We might want to use that heat map to say, okay, if I broke it up into seven, 10, 12 groups, give me these sets of genes which follow this many patterns, okay? There are lots of methods um, for deciding how many groups you have in your data or for breaking your clusters like this into subgroups. And those include things like k-means, SOM, which was very popular for a while, HOPAC we used to use in Cambridge a lot. The pHeatMap package actually has built in this k-means uh, clustering. So it can do k-means clustering uh, very easily and it uses hierarchical clustering too. If we want to take advantage of P heat map placing our genes into a certain number of groups for us, we can actually just add additionally to our um, P heat map argument K means K here equals seven. And it's going to try and take this heat map here and break it up into seven clusters. I haven't put much more thought into that number of clusters other than just looking at the heat map and thinking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It seemed pretty visually obvious. If I run that then, P heat map does something a little different rather than showing me every single gene. It now just shows me the clusters it's created and the average expression for genes in those clusters. So I have um, you know, a cluster which is up in heart, a little less up in liver, down in kidney, has 631 genes, and it's called cluster three. Right? I've got cluster four, six, which is pretty much my liver specific, and I got cluster seven, which is pretty much my kidney specific. Maybe cluster one would be my heart specific. From this heat map, which is returned K here. So this is printed to screen, but this object K actually contains uh, a list of information. And if I look inside the K means slot of that list, we can see we have um, cluster centers, uh, total sum of squares, lots of inf information here. 
what we really want to get to is the cluster membership for every single gene. So we can actually find out one gene was in this cluster seven, maybe another gene was in this cluster one, and I could perhaps label a gene in cluster seven as kidney specific. We can extract that from our object just by running this line here. Effectively, it's going to extract the cluster membership and put this into a data frame for us. And then I'm just going to allocate one name or one column name and kind of call it cluster. And if we look at it, what we have is a data frame with one column, the cluster membership based on this heat map here, and then the name of the gene. Okay. I can now use that um, in combination with my original significant matrix to try and create a heat map where I can see all the genes and I can label them on the left with a new column, which will be, sorry, with a new annotation, which will be this data frame here, cluster, and then row name being entrees ID. So I'm just gonna order my matrix by the clustering order. So whether it was one in matrix one or matrix, oh, sorry, if it was in cluster one, three, four, or five, and then I will make a heat map of that. I will add the cluster membership as my data frame. Um, and I'm not going to show any row names. And I'm also going to ask it not to cluster my rows. Because I should have already ordered it by cluster membership here. If I then look at this, we can see that's exactly what I have. This is now organized by the k-means clusters. And you can see we've got cluster one here, which was our uh, heart specific. And then cluster two would be our kind of shared heart and kidney. And that's exactly what it is. So now, even though we've done k-means clustering, we can still arrange our total heat map and have a look at it this way too. So in order to decide the number of clusters you actually, number of um, clusters you actually want to get from your data, we can actually use a method called the silhouette score. Okay, so silhouette method effectively assesses the within cluster similarity to the between cluster similarity. And the idea is that if you find the optimal number of clusters, um, really that should be when you have the most similarity within clusters and the most difference between clusters. So members of the same cluster are most similar to each other, but different clusters are most distinct from each other. And we actually can use the silhouette method within this package mbclust, and this is the one we were using with Mary Beth Hatton's lab to try and find this optimal number of clusters. All we need to do is provide to this the matrix we want to cluster, um, we need to tell it the distance we want to use. Here it's going to be Euclidean. We tell it the method of clustering we want to use in final version, which will be K means, just like we ran in P heat map. And I tell it what score I want to use in order to find my optimal number of clusters. And here I'm going to use the silhouette score. Now, when I run this, um, I also provide the minimum number of clusters to separate my data into, so two. And then I can also prevent the maximum number of clusters. And if I have over 12 clusters, it's going to get complex. So I want to have at least somewhere between two and 12. Once I've run this, I can just use this slot within my object, dollar best number of clusters. And it's going to tell me here that I should have used three clusters. Okay, so then if I want to actually see how, what the three clusters would have looked like, I can extract that also from this cluster num. So this best NC told me the number of clusters. I have this slot best partition and very similar to that data frame we saw, this has um, genes here, gene IDs at the top. So the names of this vector are gene IDs and the values are the membership within our three clusters. So if we then sort this by our best partition, we can get our ordered clusters. So I sort them by their cluster number. 
And again, I can just reorganize our significant matrix based on this ordered cluster here. And we can see then if we look at this, to me, this isn't as pretty as our K means, but it was saying that probably the best separation was for three, which makes sense because we have three groups. Um, if we look at this, then we can see, yes, now we're only getting significance or only getting groups which are uh, heart specific, kidney specific, or liver specific. So that might not be ideal for you. And if you wanted to have more separation, you can actually minimize or change your minimum number of clusters. And if you set that above three, you might find you discover seven as the next. So that's the um, course for today. I'm oh, sorry that was a little long. Um, we have a link to some exercises here. Oh, nope, that's the wrong. So I think maybe Matt's put in the wrong, but if you come up here and go to exercises, part three, you should find that we have um, some exercises here. Maybe it's, sorry, let me just dig that out again. Um, okay, sorry, I think those look a little backwards. Let me just check this. That's going to be fun. So let me see if our exercises for our next session are actually our exercises for our present session. Okay. Nope. Okay. So give me a second. I will. I just came across these exercises. I'll have to dig them out for us. And um, go here. I'll have to put them in chat. I think. Great. So I'm going to put them in chat, the actual exercises. They are part three. I think there's just a mislink in my course. They're in chat here. You follow the chat on the Zoom, or, sir, I will show you how to get to them in class here. I actually really like these exercises. We get to do a PCA, we get to do an LRT test, and then we actually get to project the loadings of our PCA onto our kind of heat map. We can see the second principal component separating out kidney here. And then we're going to extract some information from some go terms and try and then um, plot them and see the PCA. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so I'll leave you to do that for the next um, hour or so. I will be back for 2.30 to run through the next um, session where we'll be doing gene set and enrichment analysis. So we'll be taking our sets of genes and trying to um, find ways to characterize them by the functional groups associated with them. This is cellular process genes. These are metabolism points, et cetera. I'm sharing my screen um, and we're going to continue into the next session, which is really concentrating on how we can try and do functional enrichment. Um, given a set of genes, do we have an enrichment within them for a particular biological process, immunological processes, immune response, interferon response, uh, metabolism? Really, are our genes that we have defined as interesting, be it up, down in a condition within a certain cluster? Do they have a particular function? Do they have a particular role um, in their actions? So previously, we've done our alignment and counting. We did a little bit of differential gene expression. We looked very briefly at how we can do PCA and clustering. Now, in this session, we're going to cover this idea of functional enrichment uh, testing, which we can more generally call gene set analysis, because a gene set is um, effectively a collection of genes grouped by some shared common feature. And it can be very well defined, or it can be as abstract as these are your favorite genes, and you just want to test them. So we've been using um, some tissue data previously, but I think in our first sessions, we showed an alignment and some counting using Christina Leslie's uh, data. She's just over the road in MSKCC. 
And she put some data for T regulatory cells where she was pre and post activation. So uh, what's the word for it? Not quiescent, um, resting T cells, not yet exposed to a stimulant and then exposed to some antigen and they become activated. So we should see a lot of differential gene expression. And hopefully, you know, we know T cells, we know that they should be doing something in immunological. So hopefully we can pick that up in the data too. Another nice feature about using this data is that I think when we come to ChIP-seq or ATTACK-seq, we're going to use the same data. So they have ATTACK-seq and RNA-seq for the same data, which makes this really useful. And I'm not picking on Christina Leslie, her data looks fantastic. Um, so if you're in our lab, it's only a positive thing that I'm using this data. Um, we don't have several intermediate files um, and you can actually find them on our GitHub. They're also probably in the download as well. <clears throat> so we're not gonna ask you running through this course to actually process the data for every single thing. I will have processed it for you. And in this case, I've used our subread for alignment. I've done summarize overlaps, and then I would have analyzed the data using DC2. Exactly what we've done in the class. Um, you will then find I will have made an Excel file. It's not an Excel file, it's a comma separated values file, CSV. But you should find that in the data directory, um, and we'll use some of this, I think, or some other process data to try and look, do we see an enrichment for genes between activated and resting, genes which go up or down? Um, and can we, can we associate some functions to this? So we've already kind of looked at how we can find experimentally interesting genes up in heart, down in heart by our statistics. Perhaps we could rank our genes by their contribution to a principal component, to a PC, that can be useful too. Oh, if we've got multiple groups, we might end up clustering our genes. And then we will find a cluster uh, which is up in a particular condition, maybe up less in another condition, and down in the third condition. That might be an interesting set of genes to us. Too. However we define these genes, we can then look and evaluate whether there's an enrichment for functionally related genes. So do cell cycle genes can change more between conditions than, say, other genes change? or are genes related to immune response enriched in any of the clusters we may have defined. So the first thing we're going to need is gene set. Okay, and this is a general term. Here we go, gene set, a named collection of genes. So all the genes together, and they are immunological genes. They are my favorite genes. Some, something which we can test. The name is the effectively the function, the property we are testing for enrichment. Gene set is this general idea. Uh, gene set enrichment analysis, let's say with a small e here, probably a small s and a, is a very broad term for correlating a set of genes with a condition or a phenotype. Different to this, and we, this is generally referred to as GSA, is GSEA, so gene set enrichment analysis, which is actually a software created by the Broad. Um, and we can talk a little bit about its history later. It's kind of interesting. But it's their tool for correlating a set of genes with conditional phenotype. So GSA is the general idea. GSEA is a particular tool written by Broad. Um, which is very popular, and I'm sure if you're going to do RNA-seq, you'll at least come across this. In order to do any of this enrichment, we need to find some gene sets which are interesting. Um, so gene sets which are, as we just said, collections of genes. We want collections of genes maybe based on their function, biological process, or cellular location. So, you know, metabolizing a particular uh, protein, uh, maybe that's involved in a process related to destruction of a cell, apoptosis, and that happens in the cell membrane. These are all gene sets which we may find then in the gene ontology consortium. Biological pathways, um, 
glycolysis, glyconeogenesis, those types of associated genes we'll often find in places called reactome, or a site called reactome. Actually, um, a lot of you are probably more familiar with KEG, which is, uh, I think I'll come to it later on, but it's the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. This has whole maps of pathways, mostly to do with metabolism, some to do with diseases. The reason that isn't highlighted at the top of this page is just because for a period of time, KEG became non-public, which means a lot of the databases became out of date. You needed to pay to get access. I think KEG is now free again, but it means that a lot of the databases, when it went private, they kind of abandoned it. So it never got updated. Reactome is freely available, therefore updated, and you'll get better quality gene sets from it. These are all sources of gene sets, but obviously you can also define your own gene sets. And we often define gene sets based on papers. So this paper may be defined their set of genes under a particular knockout. Uh, let's say PTB1 knockout response of genes. I will define that from a paper and I can make my own gene set. So the Gene Ontology Consortium is probably one of the most famous collections of gene sets. I've spent so many of my bioinformatics years working with this set of resources. Um, this gene ontology, there are other ontologies like mammalian phenotype ontology, um, but this is our probably the most well-known ontology of gene sets. And it aims to provide a comprehensive resource of all the currently available knowledge regarding the functions of genes and gene products. Uh, functional categories, it's going to split it into. So gene ontology is roughly or is split into three major broad categories. And that is gene ontology of the molecular functions. So the activity of a gene's protein product. Very closely related is biological process, which isn't necessarily the activity, but the role of that activity, uh, the role of a gene's protein product. So activity might be catalyzing a particular um, metabolic uh, pathway or uh, destruction of a particular protein, but the role would be, say, apoptosis. Cellular components is also very useful, and this is where in the cell the protein product sits. So cell membrane, nucleolus, endoplasma reticulum, we also have these definitions. So really, cool thing about ontologies is that they are structured nested graphs. So for gene ontology, um, we're just focusing here on one of these big sub ontologies. So these are the sub ontologies. But here we have biological processes sitting at the very top of the graph. And then if we follow this down, we may have pigmentation here on the second level. And beneath that, we will have pigmentation, more specific term during development. And underneath that, we will have regulation of, pig of pigment during development. And maybe under that, we will have negative regulation. And finally, we'll get to something very specific, negative regulation of eye pigmentation. So following down this tree, all the genes may be in biological processes. A subset of them may be involved in pigmentation, and a further subset may be involved in this. So all the way down, we will get more specific gene sets, less gene members, more specific functions until we get to the bottom. And often we'll have something uh, very specific down there, negative regulation of eye pigmentation. So this graph is useful, not just uh, for visualization here, but we can also use some clever tricks to kind of group related terms together. The reactome, as I just mentioned, is probably the updated version of KEG or the more updated version of KEG. But both of these really focus on molecular pathways. Um, and this plot I'm showing here is actually all the pathways or metabolomic, metabolomic pathways um, inside KEG. So we can see all these are curated um, and they have genes associated to every pathway. These are mostly focused on metabolism. Some disease pathways, um, and although they're not built into ontologies like this, 
they're also very useful to get an idea of this gene is involved in this disease, this disease gene is involved in this particular metabolic function. Final one actually we'll talk about, I think it's the final one, um, is MSIGDB. So the molecular signature databases um, is available from Broad and it kind of is an accompaniment to this tool I mentioned earlier on, GSEA, Gene Set Enrichment Analysis. These gene sets are effectively available to us as plain text. We can just download them. Um, and they're usually formatted such to either be in JSON or something which is easily readable by Java, R, Python, a format certainly we can parse. So we can actually go, I've got MSIGDB open here somewhere. I guess I'm gonna come back to it in a few, a few slides. Maybe I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So in R, we have, just like we have BS genome packages to hold our species, TXDB packages to hold our uh, gene models. And then we have org species.db packages to hold the map of gene IDs to symbols. Inside R, we have um, the GoDB package, the Reactome DB package. I think there is a Cake DB package. It's just, as I said, a bit old now. Um, so these are packages which hold all the information on gene ontology or Reactome. You can actually get some of this information also from the individual org.db packages. They actually contain the uh, gene to keg, gene to reactome, gene to gene ontology map. The GoDB package actually holds this idea of the ontology. So it tells you how it's structured. Okay. So in Bioconductor, we know we can access these um, just by installing the library. And if, if we want to install a Bioconductor library, hopefully you remember, you can just search it by Google. And we can just do uh, copy this and paste this into our R Studio session. But once we've got them installed, we can load them. Library Go DB, I'll load. Reactome DB will load. And this last package we'll load, GSEA Base, is really a package originally built around interacting with the MSIGDB formats, so the formats from here. But now, more broadly, um, is a nice method to kind of hold your gene sets. So actually, GSEA base formats are then often used by modern um, enrichment tools. So the first thing we'll look at here is the MSIGDB. Um, and we can go to the broad site to actually have a look at this in a second. The MSIGDB breaks up the gene sets into seven very broad functions. I think it's still seven. They're always updating. So it's a little look. Eight or, okay. Eight things now, we can go have a look. So the first one here is hallmark gene sets. And this is a very generic set of gene sets. Um, and these include things like, let's have a look. Uh, browse 50 gene sets. Sorry, here they are. Things like apoptosis, um, E2F targets, DNA repair, hypoxia, glycolysis. So very general um, terms really just marker genes of these particular functions. So it's a very small gene set, um, but often good to give you an idea about what's happening. C1 is positional gene sets. So this is the position for where a gene is on a chromosome. It may be you are affecting some you know, portion of one chromosome. So C1 just groups genes by where they are across the chromosomes, what minor major cytobands they're in. Skipping ahead, uh, C5 is our gene ontology gene set. They are also contained within MSIGDB. C2 is effectively keg and reactome. They're also contained within here. So it includes these inside our MCDB. So if we went, you can see here, keg, reactome. On top of that, it has things like wiki pathways, biocarta, which is another react, uh, reactome-like database. Um, oh, 
we have motif gene sets. So someone has already gone and scanned upstream of every gene. Does it have a particular motif? We have that too. And then we have computational gene sets. And these are gene sets derived from other people's experiments. So if someone's detected that this set of genes are upregulated in SARS COVID infection, you will often find that somewhere in the C5, sorry, C4. Oops, oops, oops. So it'd be somewhere in here. C5 was gene ontology. And then we had oncogenics, so gene sets related to um, particular cancers, immunological gene set, <coughs> so gene sets associated with particular diseases, <coughs> immunological responses, and actually I think it is in there that we would find SARS-CoV-2. Uh, well, maybe not. I've seen it in here before, I think it's just somewhere deep in this list. And then finally, one which I didn't see before is cell type uh, signature gene sets. And you can imagine where these are going to become useful for. And this is for things like single cell. When you want to know, uh, does my cluster of cells look like a particular known cell type? You could use this definition here to, to calculate, oh, my gene set, this particular cluster is enriched for liver specific cells or liver specific genes. So the GSEA format we actually get from Broad here, the one if we download it, I go and find keg maybe, click on this one. You can see here it has some formats available for us, including, like I said, JSON, XML. But one of the best formats is this GMT, Gene Matrix Transposed. And why we like that format is really because it's useful both for GSEA itself, their tool, um, but we can also import it using our GSEA base library. So to read in one of these GMTs we just downloaded, so if I went here and I downloaded this GMT, we'll go and get that from my computer. I can then get this into R by loading the GSEA base package and just running their function git GMT I'll load this GMT, I have to give it connection, which is the path to my GMT object. Okay. So if this is C7, it's going to contain a set of a whole lot of gene sets. And then these come in to what is now called a gene set collection. And we can see if we just read here, we have the names of every gene set. So here is the hallmark. Um, this is hypoxia, this is TNFA signaling. We have the genes. Um, which are in here. So we have 4,000 genes in total. And it's this gene set collection that we can use to start to manipulate and handle the gene sets. In. So we can get access to the individual gene sets by using the same, like most of these objects, we can use the same accessors as we did for lists. So if we do double square brackets and put one in there, we will get the first gene set in our list. TNFA signaling via T, uh, NF kappa beta. We have the gene IDs in it. We have uh, various other details. If I want to get the names of every gene set in my list, I can just use, just like with a normal vector, the names accessor, and I get a vector of all the names. Okay, so I can access individual gene sets by using list like indexing. I can get the names of my gene set objects um, by using names on my gene set collection object. If I want to get something really useful, which is a list of every single gene set, right? So basically to extract out of this a list where the names are the name of the gene set and the values in that list are all the genes associated to that gene set. So gen B, CLX2 are all members of this gene set. We can use this gene IDs function. We give it the uh, gene set collection we created earlier on. And here I'm just showing the first three. It's a list, I can do it that way. We're just seeing the first one printed. We don't necessarily need to work 
with GMT files. And the issue here with MSIGDB, which isn't a big problem. Um, no, I lost MSIGDB. Is that this is all based on human. So all the IDs here are human IDs. So you can do some simple things like translate your human IDs, your mouse IDs to human ID equivalent, right? But one way to save yourself a little bit of this hassle uh, and then getting these kind of gene sets available to you is using this MSIG DBR package. So MSIG DB, you know. Slightly strange thing about this is this isn't a bioconductor package. This is actually a CRAN package, which is really frustrating. Um, and a lot of packages don't end up in bioconductor just because bioconductor is a little tough in its review process. Um, the nice thing about MSIGDBR is that it actually takes advantage of another package called uh, Babel Gene. Okay. And Babel Gene itself basically combines lots of different databases of orthologs to, to be able to try translate human to any one of these species. So if you're a mouse, you can translate to mouse. If you're a rat, you can translate to rat. Xenopus, uh, chicken, horse, zebrafish, dog, I think, C. elegans, cow. You can translate, oh, I should have just read here. That would have been a lot easier. You can translate to any of these particular uh, species, and you can do that just in one line. It will handle all that. So MSIGDBR, we give it a species. Um, here we're going to say mus musculus. I'm going to ask for a category, and here I'm asking for hallmark. We do question mark, uh, MSIGDBR. I'm not sure if I've got this installed, actually. Let me see. Have a look. Um, and here, oh yeah, so we can just use the abbreviations from the MSIG DB collection, which are H, C1, C2, C4, C3, and that's how we can import them into. Once we've got this, it just gives us a data frame. It's called a Tibble. This is just another special version of a data frame, but it has the category, uh, the name of the hallmark of the of the uh, gene sets and the gene symbols, um, as well as the entrees ID, ensemble ID, and then the human gene symbol. So what it's translated it from. So now we've got our gene sets. Um, we actually want to do some enrichment analysis on them. We really have two major ways of doing this. There are probably three, but we're going to discuss two. I'm happy to discuss the third offline. Uh, I hope I'm not still muted. Um, so these two major methods, ways of doing it, is first we will test for an association of our gene set, so our functional term, with our group of interesting genes. So we will previously upfront define a set of genes which are interesting for us. And effectively, we will test, does this gene, our interesting genes, have a significant overlap with this functional set of genes? Do we have more overlapping than we would expect by chance? The second method really doesn't define upfront an interesting set of genes. But really, it, you have to define an interesting way of ranking your genes. So in this case, it may just be uh, log hole changes or statistics between heart and liver. I rank all my genes by how much they've changed from positive to most negative change. And then I can just see, are, is a particular gene set highly ranked in this list? And maybe more than chance. If I found out the top 100 most upregulated genes are all immunological genes. That might be something really interesting, and I might want to follow up those genes. I can say maybe this list is associated with this ranked vector is associated with immunological genes. 
in order to really tell you when you should choose one over the other, often we will run both. Functional enrichment um, works best when you have a set of genes like from clustering. I'll define this as you know up, up. Um, and there's really no way of ranking a gene once you've done things like clustering. It's a little bit too multifactorial to give you one rank. GSEA, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more when we get to the part. GSEA is really fantastic if your genes are changing too much. You have too much differential expression between your genes. And it's hard to define what you would say is interesting. If you have 8,000 differentially expressed genes, you know, what are you going to say is the most interesting? It's all about GSEA itself was probably invented in reality because there was no genes which passed significance. And if you read the original papers on GSEA, um, they were looking at a particular knockout and only one gene was significant out of the 24,000 genes they were looking at. Um, so they developed a new method, which actually looks at the ranking and doesn't need cutoffs like CMAC. So GSEA is best when it's hard to define a set of interesting genes, either because you have too much of them, um, either because you have too many or really too little differentially expressed genes in your genes. It's just not interesting to, it's not easy to define the set of interesting genes. So we can use DSeq2 and we can use these results we've generated previously to try and um, do some enrichment. So I'm gonna read in our set of uh, activated minus resting, previously defined in DSeq2, and we can look at this now and you can see this is basically the, what we would get out from our first session where we defined a differentials. I have still here um, some NAs, which is I guess where I have been unable to get any reads on my genes. So there's no way of doing a full change. But I have the symbol and I have the entrees ID and I must have merged in some annotation to add this additional symbol. All these methods wish us or ask us to filter the genes to those tested for differential expression. So we need to filter this down to remove all these NAs, which we considered too low and DSeq marked them um, and didn't give them a p-adjusted score. So what we'll do then is filter all our genes to just have rows where there is no NA in the p-adjusted column. So this column here, we can do that as we saw previously, just filtering our table. Um, we only take rows where the P adjusted is not an A. So now we have our three rows. This isn't sorted or ordered, but we can see we have genes here like MMDN1. This passes our significance testing and we have our P adjusted here. So uh, gene sets, we can test for enrichment multiple different ways. Um, one of the most popular ways for doing functional enrichment on a set of interesting genes, so not a GSEA-like test for RNA-seq, is using the GoSeq package. Um, and the reason we use the GoSeq package, as we'll see later on, is because it accounts for potential biases we may see in RNA-seq. This is primarily to do with longer genes tend to have more reads on them because they're just longer on the genome, more chance of getting reads and sequencing them. And this just means they have more chance of being detected as differential. Even after we account for all these biases in DC2, we still find this effect. So we can kind of account for it now in our gene oncology enrichment. So the GoSeq package requires a named vector of ones or zeros indicating whether a gene is upregulated, downregulated, but really it's one if it's regulated, it's zero if it's unchanging. The names will be the names of the genes. So we'll have a long vector for every gene. The names will be the name of the gene and we'll have a one or a zero next to it to tell us whether it was differential. Or not. So here we're going to find differential as less than 0 0.05 for the p-adjusted column and was positively regulated. So activated minus resting. If the log file change was greater than zero, it means it was up in the activated sample. So we can build this ones or zeros list 
by first creating a true or false list. Okay, I'm not sure if we've um, seen this before, but here we can show you. This will produce a true false list of those which are true will have be less than 0 0.05 here and have a log fold change greater than zero. Let me just show you this in R. Once we have a true or false list, like this, okay. Uh, sorry, a true false vector. Although we see it as true, false, true, actually internally, if I try and add zero to this, you can see that it's actually treated as a number. True is one, false is zero. So if I want to turn my true, false into ones or zeros, which would be appropriate for this GOSI package, I can just do plus zero and it will turn it into a ones or zeros. It's actually more efficient computationally not to do it like that, but to do as dot integer. And this is like we've had as dot data frame over and over again. So we'll just turn our true false into a ones or zeros. Actually, I've never tried it before. I wonder if I can turn that back into a logical as dot logical. So you can kind of move back and forward between ones and zeros and logicals just by converting them by as dot integer or as dot integer. So in this case, I'm going to convert my trues or falses into a integer vector. And then I need to assign the names to it. So it knows that, you know, this gene was not differentially expressed. That's the name of the gene. So I give them the vector names by just names and then assign the entrees gene ID. Now, if I just look at the first four, none of them were differentially regulated, but we have the gene names here, entrees IDs and zero showing they weren't differential. And we can look at the table and we can see we have, you know, 2,450, which went up significantly, and then 10,000, which didn't. Before we get started with GoSeq, we need to make sure we have a genome available inside GoSeq for us. So we can just check this by using the supported genomes function. This gives us a data, data frame, and in that data frame, we have the DB. We have the species, so we need to check that our species is available. And then we have here also the available genes, which we can use for this enrichment analysis. Gene ID is usually good, but ensemble ID, gen scan ID, which for lizard we had Xenoref ID. So then what we can do is use the GoSeq package with our vector of ones or zeros, and we pass this first, having loaded the package to this null p function. Okay, so we pass that vector. We need to tell it the species, and we can do that by basing it on what we saw here, what the DB name was, and the appropriate species for us. We need to select the gene ID we want to use, and although we can't see it here, no gene was available for mouse. And here I'm going to say plot fit equals true. That is the default. And what it then does is actually give us back a little plot. Well, it gives us back an object we will use in the next step, but it also shows this plot. Okay, and this is really the nature of GoSeq. GoSeq is going to try and account for biases and potential length, um, so longer genes potentially being more differentially regulated and sometimes less differentially regulated. And it's going to try and fit a line to this to correct our p-values. So if you look on this, actually, it's kind of slightly the opposite way. So what it's done is it's binned all our genes by their length. And this bin here on this side would be a bin of very long genes. And this would be a bin of very short genes, or sorry, less long genes. And right up here, you would have all your short genes. And so all your short genes are binned together here. But then calculates the number of differentially expressed genes within each bin, and then tries to fit a line to this to enable us to correct your p-values when you do the enrichment analysis. So in this case, you can actually see kind of the opposite we might expect. 
shorter genes tended to be more differentially expressed, right? They had higher proportional differential for the bins of shorter genes. And as we move along, we kind of got less and less proportional differentially expressed genes. So by running this function null p, it's going to try and correct for that. And then we just move on to the next function, go seek. And here we're going to provide our result from our null p kind of correction. And we tell it again, nm10, we tell it known gene, but now we need to specify the categories we want to test over. And we should have available to us go BP, go MF, go CC. And actually, strangely, we have keg. I haven't actually checked that. So let's check to see what's available inside GoSeq. Load the library. Maybe I don't have that installed. Let's install that. So that's interesting. If you install GoSeq, it also installs gene length database. So that's what it's using to pre-calculate all the lengths. Uh, and it uses the biased urn package to correct this bias for longer genes, maybe more or less differentially expressed. They can come back to that. I just wanted to see what other, maybe it added additional categories here. So by running the GoSeq with our species, our IDs we're using and telling it the test categories, and we can provide him more than one test category and give it a vector of categories. They then give us back the differentially enriched terms. And we can see we have over enrichment here or luckily immune system process, which makes a lot of sense. This is T cells being activated so it should see something like immune system process, but we also see response to stimulus, defense response. Okay, so sensible gene sets showing up in our first three. This is the ID of the gene set. So Googling that will bring you to the um, Go page, but this is the actual description of that. We can now actually, if we wanted to, retrieve the genes which maybe we saw in one of these processes. So Immune system process is quite general, but somewhere just off the top 10, we would have found immune response. And that would have been the Go ID 006955. If we wanted to actually look at these individual genes, we can extract which genes are in this gene ontology uh, set by using the org package for our species. So here we'll do org mmeg.db. And I'm just going to use the annotation DBI package to select from here. Usually we're using key type and we're looking up a symbol. So here I'm going to look, use my key type will be gene ontology. Uh, so go all my, oh, sorry. I wanted to try and just move along a little bit here. My key, what I'm going to look up is the go term I'm interested in here. And I'm going to ask it to return to me my entrees IDs. And now we can see it gives us back the gene ontology uh, term here, the idea of evidence. So how much evidence is there that this gene is actually in this gene ontology? And then the, gene onto the actual genes in the gene ontology down here. We can then filter our genes down or our differential expression table just down to these genes because these might be the ones they were in an enriched term. We know they're differential. It might be something worth following up. Um, so we can then use this table just to filter down the unique entrees IDs here. And that will give us this shorter list of all the genes which are in this gene term. We can then filter our activated minus resting table from earlier just by using their entrees IDs column and finding out those which overlap with the immunological response entrees IDs. With that, we can then send that to file, just containing our immunological response genes, and that might be something we want to do for further analysis. Okay. 
So GeoSeq is a fantastic tool, provides some really nice um, correction for your data. Um, Cluster Profiler, which is a very popular now um, gene ontology tool, enrichment tool, actually has its own book online, I think somewhere. So maybe we need to follow my the links down to that book. I'll have to find that in a second. Uh, here you go, Cluster Profiler book. So there's a whole book on how you can do enrichment analysis with that Cluster Profiler tool. You know, talking through all the different steps there. I guess he's always oh, updated the look of the book, I see. Okay. Um, and you can really find a lot of information. I think this is the link here. So this is a great tool, it allows you to do multiple types of um, gene sets, but also multiple types of enrichment analysis, and it's built it all into one kind of tool set. With the information we already have, so this uh, set of interesting genes, we can actually do very similar enrichment analysis inside Cluster Profiler and get you know, a similar result, but we have some additional functionality in Cluster Profiler, which is um, perhaps appealing to us here. So we're just going to extract um, for Cluster Profiler the actual names, the IDs, sorry, for our significant genes. So here I'm just going to take those which were less than 0 0.05, irrespective of direction. And I'll just take the first column, which is our entrees IDs. Once I've loaded Cluster Profiler, I can just pass these IDs to this function in rich go. I just need to tell it the org db package to use to look up the map of entrees ID to gene ontology. So here, org.mn.eg.db, the organism package for mouse. This will then run and it will produce an object for us called a enrich result object. If we look at this in the browser, it has again useful information like the organism, the ontology we used, the key type, all the genes we had, um, and various other information here. If we want to start to get to this. Hopefully, we'll show you this in a few slides. Maybe not. If I actually want to get to this result under the hood, I can just do as dot data frame and it will extract a data frame of enriched results. So here you can also convert this to a data frame. What's really nice about Cluster Profiler is it has built into it some really easy ways just to visualize your results. So if I just want to visualize the top hits, one thing we can do is Cluster Profiler and just use the dot plot function. And if I give it the enrich object, so this object here, and I can tell it just show me the first six hits. All right, so here it's only going to show me the top six. I can see now we have a ratio of differential expressed genes within this particular terms, and then they're colored in by their p adjusted values. And the higher or the bigger the actual uh, plot or the, the uh, circle, the more genes were in that term. So I might say, well, this gene set looks very enriched. Um, this one too, but maybe this one has less genes in it, not so significant although it's still very significant. A really cool thing about um, Cluster Profiler is its interactions with this Enrich plot package. And it's hard to really give you a demo of this in class. Um, but what Enrich plot's gonna do is add the concept of how similar these gene sets are. So for gene ontology, this is really straightforward to do. And if we just go back quickly to here, you know, if these gene sets are share a common ancestor, so if we see an enrichment for this gene set and this gene set, they're both pigmentation related. So maybe we'll want to kind of cluster them close by in our plot. So this enrich plot function inside Cluster Profiler will actually do this for us. We just need to run one more function first, and that's pairwise term sim. So it's going to find out the pairwise similarity between the clusters. 
and then it will update the object. And then I can just send that now to this emap plot function. I tell it I want to see 15, the top 15. I can control the label a bit. Open this up on a new tab. We can see here then it's placing gene sets which are related. So transcriptional co-regulator activity has now been connected to DNA binding transcriptional factor. Actin bindings next to actin filament bindings. Uh, GTPA's regulator activities next to nucleotide triphosphate regulator activities. So this just means that when we see terms enrich, we don't need to now worry about, you know, are those terms basically the same meaning? It will cluster those terms which have similar meaning right next to each other, and then I can concentrate maybe on distinct terms. I can treat these as one term, and maybe these as a so I think the final thing we're going to talk about, see that's a much better email plot coming up, is uh, GSEA. So you know, GSEA has a great history really, um, and it's probably the most popular enrichment tool. I think this and the website David are the most popular uh, enrichment tools for, for uh, gene expression analysis. Um, GSEA itself is a Java-based tool. You can download it, it will run on your machine. You can just give it the input, effectively a ranked set of, um, a ranked list of genes, like one file where all the genes are ranked by a particular score. And what it does is it tests whether our gene set, set is correlated uh, with the ranking of the genes. So, and if we look at this here, we can see that if I was ranking my genes along the X of here, and this could be, in this case, let's say fold change, I would rank all my genes across the X from the most upregulated to the most downregulated. And I would just mark as a bar here when I come across a gene which is in my gene set. Okay. So if you look across here, we can see lots of bars kind of crowded at this end, maybe barely any bars crowded at this end. This is telling me that most of the genes in this gene set are at the higher end, the upregulated set of genes. And then I can use mechanisms, methods inside um, GSEA, which effectively runs what, what they call a random walk. But you can think of this as an ECDF, so an accumulative distribution. And effectively, it moves from the top of this list, walking along the list. And every time it comes across a gene, which is in the gene set, it adds a score, and it adds a value, and it keeps on adding the values as it moves down this list until we get to a point where we have a maximum. So every time it doesn't come across a value, it also subtracts a little bit. And it's the actual score here versus um, the minimum values, which is this distance from here to here, which we call our enrichment score. Um, and from using permutation beyond that, it can then give us a normalized enrichment score. All these methods are just really, I mean, this is how GSEA works, but the methods this GSEA-like methods are effectively saying, do we have more of our gene set towards the top or the bottom of the list than we would expect by chance? Or is our gene set just randomly distributed across this rank list? So the first thing we need to do is rank our genes by some type of score if we want to use this. Um, and one thing which I would absolutely recommend and I think is widely recommended as the best way to rank your gene sets, uh, sorry, genes for a gene set enrichment analysis is to use the stat column, okay? Previously, I mentioned this, we have this log fold shrink function. Um, and if you read the DC paper, actually log fold shrink can also be used as input for GSEA, but we don't need to do that. We can just take the stat so I'm just going to create a vector of our stats. You can see that here. And like GoSeq, I need to provide names to this vector so I can associate the stat with an entrees ID. 
So I'll do names and associate the entrees IDs. And then here, I'm just gonna order this vector by the highest ranked um, decreasing equals true. So we'll go from higher to lower. You can see that organized here. Often GSEA programs will use the GMT files and that's because GSEA and MSIGDB are, are, are very related. So here we're going to use MSIGDBR to extract some gene sets um, to test in our GSEA analysis. So I'm just going to take the table we got from MSIGDB, which if you remember previously was a little longer. Where was it? So here we have all these gene set category, gene set name, gene symbol, gene ID, ensemble ID. We don't need most of that table. In fact, we can just extract the columns we're really interested in, which are here going to be the IDs that we're using in our um, significance testing. So our entrees IDs, I'm going to extract that column and I'll extract a gene set name. And this is the name of the set. We will see whether it's enriched or not. To run GSEA then, I can just take this data frame and I can provide it to a new argument term to gene. So I use my GSEA function from cluster profiler. I give it my ranked um, vector here. So the gene names and the stat. I provide the gene sets I wanna test now to the term to gene function. I just need to tell it how many iterations to do or when to believe it's summarized. And we can usually use the default here just because this is running on GitHub to update this class. I'm gonna run that a little smaller. And this will go off a run GSEA under the hood within cluster profiler. And then with those results, we can just do everything we've just done before. We can use the same dot plot, just show the first six. Um, and these look very sensible. T cell down, T cell down. So T cell related terms here, naive versus, and I guess this is stimulated in some way, naive versus, I guess this is stimulated. So it looks like we're seeing the gene sets we would wanna see. We can also pass this to our pairwise term sim uh, function, and then to the emap plot function, just as we did previously, Again, you can see it's clustering gene sets by here, the similarity of the members. So if a gene set had the same kind of gene makeup, the same gene members, they'll be clustered closer together. So I guess this one here, naive versus day eight, probably has the same genes as, or very similar genes versus 15, versus this one here. Finally, we can actually get, um, so I showed you this kind of plot here. This is the GSEA, uh, one way of visualizing GSEA. And we can see that the gene members are kind of clustered towards the top ranking here. We can do a similar plot inside R by just running GSEA plot, give it our object we just created, tell it the ID of the gene set we want to test. So here I'm not giving it the actual ID. I'm just telling it I want to use the first one. Tell it here, I know this is, the, this is the default, so we can leave this the same by running score. And I can put a title onto the top of my plot. If I look at that, this is my GSEA-like enrichment plot. Where, where did it go? There we go. And even clearer than the example I showed, you can see for the ones which are most upregulated gene sets, you can see all the genes for this gene set seem to, or a lot of the genes for this gene set are grouped over in the very highly ranked here. So it's a nice visualization that yes, all the genes in this particular term were highly upregulated in this particular instance. Okay. So that ends us, brings us to the end of today's session. Um, we have some exercises and now, hopefully these exercises are relevant. Um, and we're gonna do a few simple things. We will do a go-seek enrichment. We will do some cluster profiling and then we will use that to make this really nice example of an EMAP plot where we have things to do with drug metabolism up here 
diseases uh, over here, and then I think this is muscle contraction, et cetera, here, calcium signaling. And then finally, we will combine uh, what we did with the PCA to try and, um, oh no, sorry, we'll combine what we were doing with the P heat maps earlier on with extracting our leading edge genes from our cluster profile. So that's going to be an interesting fun, uh, exercise there. Okay, so that's the end of the sessions for today. Um, I'm going to put all the recordings for RNA Seq up straight after this lecture. I'm sorry, I missed put up the last one last week, and I'll put them straight up now. Um, if you want to run through these exercises, I think I will be back at 4.30, 4.40 on Zoom. I can run through them now. Also, it will be recorded and added on to the episode.